Welcome to Water Management. I'm Taylor Trent, an Extension Scholar with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's instructor, Rick Judd. Rick has been a master gardener since 2011 and has been vegetable gardening for about 35 years. Okay, Rick, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you, Taylor. So as Taylor mentioned, uh, we will be talking about water use and control in the garden. It's important to, and, and very timely to take up this topic because summer is a time of increased temperature and evaporation from the water. And we are certainly gonna be looking at ways of applying water, retaining water and using the water in the most efficient manner in our garden. Because the last thing we wanna be doing is being out on a 95 degree day and watering. This slide shows the ways that a garden loses water. It's a combination of two phenomena. One is the evaporation of water from the garden. The other is water loss through transpiration being given off through the leaves of the plant. Okay, so I have here the different months along the x-axis and the amount of water in inches along the y-axis. Now, we get about three and three quarter inches of rain a month in the Northern Delaware area. So this plot basically tells you that from May through April, you will be needing to supply extra water to your garden other than what nature provides. The topics today, we will be talking about that application of water to your garden. We'll be talking about composting, which enables the soil to become like a soil sponge and enables it to retain the moisture that is applied to it. And finally, we'll be talking about mulching which enables us to cut down on the evaporative loss from the garden. So these are ways of applying water and basically drinking in as much water as is provided and then to uh, keep it from evaporating. Topic one then is water application. The golden rule here is to make sure that the roots of your plants never dry out. And depending on the stage of life in the plant, that rule may take somewhat different forms of watering. When you first plant your seed, water it in very well. But then since the germinating seed is gonna have very shallow roots, make sure to go out every morning and mist down the top layer of your soil to make sure that those shallow roots don't dry out. As the plant matures, becomes two, three inches high and, and higher, the uh, application of one inch of water per week should be adequate, unless you have something like a 12 foot long tomato vine, which may require gallons of water. However, this, the rule still holds, just make sure that the roots never dry out. So you should have a rain gauge that tells you what nature's provided and it gives you an idea of what you have to add on top of that. Now tips for watering. Make sure that you water in the morning. You don't want to get, get the leaves of the plant wet and then have it go through the night wet as that can spread disease. In addition, don't water down through the plant, but water below underneath the leaves and that helps to keep them dry as well. So these are some watering tools that I found most beneficial. This watering nozzle, the blue nozzle up above, has a dialable head, which enables me to get a nice mist out of it. And that enables me to mist down the soil, as I mentioned, as the seed is germinating. So I go out every morning and just mist down the top of the soil well. As the plant becomes larger, two, three inches tall, and above, I use a watering wand, which is a pipe with a on-off valve here and a rosette down below, which enables a, a stream to be projected onto the plant. 
I do not show drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is considered by some to be the Cadillac of watering. It, it involves having a hose with perforations in it that allow water to drip into your soil. After four hours of water dripping into your soil, then uh, your soil is, is well irrigated. But I find these two devices, the, both the watering wand and the nozzle, to be more than adequate for purposes and used correctly to be very effective. So here I'm using the watering wand. I'm applying water at the base of a pepper plant. I make sure not to go above the lower leaves, so I make sure to stay in under there. I, I rotate the wand around the plant and watch for the soil to basically suck the water in. I continue to apply it in that way until the soil does not want to receive any more water. And you can tell that because the soil will not uh, suck it in anywhere near as rapidly, it'll just, the water will tend to sit and go much more slowly down into the soil. You'll also note that I have a mulch around these plants. I've used uh, grass here, grass clippings, as the mulch to help to preserve some of that water from evaporation. Okay, so we, we've talked about applying water. Now we'll go into the second leg, which is creating compost and composting our garden because compost is the way that we turn water in the, the soil into a water sponge and enable it to retain large amounts of water so that it can be fed back to the plants in a more consistent fashion. Compost improves water absorption, it improves water retention, and it also helps to distribute water better in the soil. If there's a, a particularly moist part of your soil, it'll tend to pull the moisture out of that area and distribute it more evenly throughout the soil. Compost also is, because it's an agglomerate material, it has a lot of small airways between the particles, and that enables air to get down into the roots of the plant and to make sure that the roots can breathe well as well as drink. There are about one to two inches of, of compost needed each year. As I mentioned, it's a substance that has a lot of organic matter and the microbes in the compost tend to eat the organic matter and, ne and you need to reapply enough compost to keep it in the, uh, to keep it in an allotment of about one to two inches of compost on the garden each year. If I were to summarize composting in one slide, this would be it, okay? Uh, the ingredients in aerobic compost, and aerobic compost the way you wanna go because it's oxygen-based and it's a faster system of composting, the ingredients are carbon, nitrogen, water, and air. Those four ingredients used appropriately will make great compost. Cut the carbon and nitrogen into as small particles as your patience allows. The smaller the particle, the quicker the composting. Mix them into a pile, turn the pile once a week, which ensures that the pile gets adequate oxygen, adequate air for decomposing into compost. And finally, keep the pile as wet as a wrung out sponge. And basically, it's as simple as that. Now let's take a little bit of look at some of the nuances in composting and how we can ensure that we speed it up. Carbon and nitrogen containing ingredients are made uh, of the following. The carbon rich ingredients are leaves, paper products, paper towels, cardboard cores, towel cores, straw, and cardboard. Nitrogen containing ingredients are grass clippings and I use non-herbicide. In other words, I don't use weed killer on the lawn so that I can safely use those grass clippings in the compost and for mulch. Weeds, vegetable and fruit peelings, tea bags, coffee grounds. So the carbon and nitrogen ingredients basically are made up of items from your backyard and from your kitchen 
which gives a great way of recycling your material into excellent product. Eggshells can be used. There can be a valuable source of calcium. I like to wash them out so I get all the albumin type syrup out of it. And then uh, also make sure to avoid meat, fish, fats, and dairy products for the main reason that you don't want to attract critters to the pile and avoid glossy magazine print because that will use uh, as, as pigment, oftentimes heavy metal-based products. So here are a couple of very common type of composters. This type, which is a rectangular composter, is three foot by three foot by three foot or four foot by four foot by four foot. Uh, it has a top on it, which can be locked down. So anything that you put into that composter can be secured away from animals coming in contact. This composter here can simply be made from a trash container. I've blown it up in this picture. Basically, you take the bottom of the trash can, you make it perforated by using a quarter inch drill and creating holes about six inches apart in eight equidistant lines all around the, the base. So there's eight of these vertical lines. The holes are four, uh, excuse me, six inches apart with each. You also put about five holes in the bottom of the container just to ensure that if there is a buildup of liquid in the bottom of the composter, the water will leach out. You get a three inch PVC pipe and you put the quarter inch holes in that in four lines equidistant around the pipe. To make a compost pile, you simply take the perforated pipe, put it into the base of the trash can and then layer in alternating layers, carbon-based materials, nitrogen-based materials, each layer about 12 inches, and you layer those in alternating layers up to the top of the composter. You put the top on, and then I like to watch the activity in the compost pile by observing the temperature of the pile. What I do is get a, uh, which can be obtained through your local supermarket, a six inch long stemmed meat thermometer, which can be pushed through one of those quarter inch holes and you can read the actual temperature of the compost. The temperature of the compost is generated by the bacteria that are eating the ingredients of the compost pile. Psychrophiles are low temperature bacteria which operate between about 28 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Mesophiles, your, your middle range bacteria operate from about 20, excuse me, from 40 to 100 degrees and thermophiles from about 100 to 160. That's, that's basically the high gear. Above about 120, a lot of weed seeds are killed. So that is your desire to get a hot compost pile so that the initial parts of decomposition into compost occur rapidly. Here we see two Thermometers in this location were at about 132. In the lower location, about 152. Now, in a composter about the size of this trash can, when you build a compost pile well, you will see the temperature increase over the first three days or so up to a maximum. In this case, it's between about 120 and 160. And then the temperature will start to back off after three days. At that point, you need to add more oxygen to the pile. So you take the top off, you fluff the pile up to get more oxygen into it, put the top back on and watch the temperature again. You'll notice that the temperature will come up again to a lower temperature this time and then start to fall back. So within about six days, you have two cycles of, comp of quick composting. And that is, occurs in between lawn mowings because in my lawn, I mow it about once a week. So once that second cycle is done, I simply take the ingredients of this composter and dump it into a rectangular composter or into a freestanding pile or a, a contained pile that may be uh, like a cylinder of 
chicken wire four feet in diameter and just let the composting continue at a lower temperature. The lower temperature, your bacteria will operate, but you'll have additional denizens of the compost pile, such as uh, fungi and various other sources and insects tending to work on the compost pile in the cooler range. Compost tools, which I found very valuable. I have here a defork cultivator. That is, allows me to grab some of the ingredients of the compost, to pull it forward, to push it around in the composter, and basically to push air into the pile. This compost turner here is a very valuable item. You find it in a garden supply catalog. It has a shaft with retractable barbs down at the bottom. When you push that tool down into the bottom of the compost pile from the top, the barbs retract against the shaft. Then when you start pulling it out, the barbs open up. And I like to auger it out of the pile and, and kind of move it around in circles in order to open up a, an air shaft down to the bottom of the compost pile. And it also helps to pull ingredients from the bottom up to the top. My third item here is simply a compost sieve. I have a frame with the uh, chicken wire stapled to the back of it. When I, my compost is completed at the end of the year, I simply put that sieve on top of the wheelbarrow. I shovel the compost onto that sieve and then I shake it. Whatever goes through the sieve or screen uh, is something that can go onto the garden. Whatever stays in the screen gets thrown back into the compost pile to, con to continue composting. Once I have this finished compost, as I mentioned to you, the, uh, if I turn it once a month, I will get finished compost in approximately one year. If I turn it uh, once every week, I will probably get finished compost in about three to four months. When I use this finished compost as a side dressing of plants, I simply place that finished compost around things like tomato stems. I put it down the lines between vegetables in the garden, and I, that provides nutrients and organic matter to the garden. Oftentimes when I get done with a crop, say I have a spring crop that is complete, I pull it out, I rake the soil with a cultivator, let the birds pick through it for a couple of days, and then I put one to two inches of compost onto that spot. I rake it in with the cultivator to a depth of about four inches, and then I will plant my next crop. Finally, at the end of the year, we can put one to two inches of compost onto the garden and just let it overwinter. As, it, as the winter passes, you'll get freezing and thawing going on, breaking the particles up into smaller pieces and ensuring that it gets incorporated into the soil. So first topic, we have talked about applying water. Second topic, we've talked about composting and helping to make the soil a soil sponge to absorb water. Now we will talk about mulching, the third member of the group that helps to retain water by decreasing the amount of evaporation from the garden. What is mulch? It is a material spread over the surface of your garden, which tends to cool and humidify the upper layer of your garden, making it more available to bacteria operating in the soil, microbes, earthworms, etc. A living soil is preserved in the upper layers by using mulch, and that's the kind of soil that gives the most efficient plant growth. In addition, we get a, uh, items such as preventing the cracking of the surface of the soil and also help from a uh, soil splash. In other words, if we mulch uh, the soil, we will not be splashing up muddy uh, 
these flecks of mud onto our plants, which then can give them soil borne diseases. So by using that mulch, we break the fall of the rain and we assure that the plants do not get splashed with waterborne diseases and, and, uh, and soil borne diseases. What types of ingredients make mulch? Compost can serve as a mulch. I prefer grass clippings that have not been uh, used with weed killer. Uh, shredded leaves can be a, a mulch. Straw can be an effective mulch. And shredded paper even, as such a shredded newspaper, as long as you don't have the glossy inserts, can be a, an effective mulch as well. So here I have a tomato plant, which has been mulched with about one to two inches of grass clippings. Note that I pull the mulch away from the stem of the plant about one to two inches. That's simply so that we don't provide hiding places for insects to chew the stem uh, while, the, while they're being covered. If you pull mul uh, the mulch back, you provide enough bare surface space so that uh, it, birds and all which will frequent your garden can help to pull the insects away from uh, attempting to get at the plant. So I want to talk a little bit about the effective use of mulch that helps to diminish a volatilization of water from your garden. Notice that a lot of people, their most favorite backyard crop is tomatoes. And one of the problems with tomatoes, a physiological problem, is blossom end rot. And that comes from not getting enough calcium that is in the soil up through the plant out into the tomato. And the calcium rides from the soil through the roots up into the stem and out into the tomato along a water stream. So if you have, if you water properly and you have the correct amount of calcium in the soil, you also compost, which helps to retain moisture in the soil and give it up as the plant needs it. And you also mulch in order to prevent water from evaporating from the soil. You ensure that that water stream on which the calcium rides out to the tomato is maintained and you maintain a consistency of calcium supply to the tomato and hence you will not have blossom end rot if you follow those uh, rules. So finally, just as a bit of a summary here, if I use one to two inches of mulch on my garden, that's enough to minimize evaporative loss, evaporation of water from my garden to cut it way down. If I use three to four inches of mulch, then I provide enough to shade the surface of the soil and to help prevent weed growth by doing that. Certainly, if there's one thing that I don't want to do is water during a 95 degree day, I also want to even less weed during a 95 degree day. So mulch can be helpful in both of those realms, minimizing the amount of times we have to water and also minimizing weeding. You will use up mulch because it's an organic material. You will use it up as the year continues because the microbes will feed on that as well. But make sure just to keep it, an eye on it, a check on it, and keep that mulch level at four to five inches if you want to minimize weed growth. Well, finally, I have here a picture of a couple of pepper plants that have increased thicknesses of mulch around them. And not only is that retaining water, but it's also helping to cut way down on weed growth. I do see a, a small weed here that in a thinner area of the mulch. But basically, this has done very well to help suppress weed growth in my garden. Summary, we've talked about watering the garden. We've talked about how not to allow the roots to dry out. We've talked about making the garden more receptive to moisture, to holding the moisture in better through the use of compost, which acts as a soil sponge. 
And then finally, we've talked about mulching, which helped to minimize the evaporation of water from the garden. Once again, helping to retain moisture in your garden so that it minimizes the number of times you have to go out and water. Thank you all very much.